Joan of Arc has fascinated many, from her simple beginnings, to her military leadership, until finally her fiery death at the stake. She is world-renowned as being France's own brand of heroine, their patron saint. But who was Joan? This documentary serves not only to examine the life of Joan of Arc, but to better understand the mystery left behind by the Maid of Lorraine. Joan of Arc was born in 1412 to Jacques d'Arc and to Isabelle Romay. She grew up in Domremy, which was at the time in the Duché de Barc, but was later renamed Domremy la Pouchette. Although Joan grew up in a town surrounded by Burgundians, the village remained loyal to France. At the age of 12, Joan began to see visions of saints, such as Saint Margaret, Saint Michael, and St. Catherine. At the age of 16, Joan of Arc asked a kinsman to bring her to nearby Vaucouleurs, where she petitioned for permission to visit the royal French court at Chignon. Robert de Baudricourt granted her an escort to visit Chignon. She made the journey through hostile Burgundian territory in a male disguise. Upon arriving at the royal court, she impressed Charles VII during a private conference. Joan petitioned for permission to travel with the army and wear the equipment of a knight. She depended on donated items for her armor, horse, sword, banner, and entourage. Her armor was said to be white. She was the only source of hope for a regime that was near collapse. Joan arrived at the Siege of Orleans on the 29th of April, 1429. The extent of her actual military leadership is a subject of historical debate. Traditional historians, such as Edward Perroy, conclude that she was a standard bearer whose primary effect was on morale. Recent scholarship that focuses on the nullification trial testimony asserts that her fellow officers esteemed her as a skilled tacitan and a successful strategist. King of England and you, Duke of Bedford, who call yourself Regent of the Kingdom of France, settle your debt to the King of Heaven, return to the Maiden, who is envoy of the King of Heaven, the keys to all the good towns you took and violated in France. Joan of Arc's letter to the English, March or April, 1429. Joan of Arc defied the cautious strategy that had characterized French leadership. During the five months of siege before her arrival, the defenders of Orléans had attempted only one aggressive move, and that had ended in disaster. On the 4th of May, the French attacked and captured the outlying fortress of St. Luc, which she followed on May 5th with a march to a second fortress called St. Jean Le Blanc. Finding it deserted, this became a bloodless victory. The next day, she opposed Jean d'Orléans at a war council where she demanded another assault on the enemy. D'Orléans ordered the city gates locked to prevent another battle. But, Joan summoned the townsmen and common soldiers and forced the mayor to unlock a gate. With the aid of only one captain, she rode out and captured the fortress of St. Augustine's. That evening, she learned that she had been excluded from a war council where the leaders had decided to wait for reinforcements before acting again. Disregarding this decision, she insisted on assaulting the main English stronghold called Les Tourelles on the 7th of May. Contemporaries acknowledged her as the heroine of the engagement after she sustained an arrow wound to her neck, but returned wounded to lead the final charge. By May 8th, the English had surrendered or deserted all of their fortifications. The French army set out for Rheims from Gennes sur Loire on the 29th of June. After a long journey, Joan reached Rheims and it opened its gates on the 16th of July. The coronation took place the following morning. In October, Joan successfully took Saint Pierre le Moitier, receiving a noble status. After minor action at the Charité sur Loire in November and December, Joan went to Compagnie the following April to defend against an English and Burgundian siege. A reckless skirmish on the 23rd of May, 1430 led to her being captured. When she ordered a retreat, she assumed the place of honor as the last to leave the field. 
Burgundians surrounded the rear guard and she was unhorsed by an archer and initially refused to surrender. The English government eventually purchased her from Duke Philip of Burgundy. Bishop Pierre Cochon of Beauvais, an English partisan, assumed a prominent role in these negotiations and her later trial. The trial for heresy was politically motivated. The Duke of Bedford claimed the throne to France for his nephew, Henry VI. She had been responsible for the rival coronation, so to condemn her was to undermine her king's legitimacy. Legal proceedings commenced on the 9th of January, 1431, at Rouen, the seat of the English occupation government. The procedure was irregular on a number of points. Several court functionaries later testified that the significant portions of the transcript were altered in her disfavor. Many clerics served under compulsion, including the Inquisitor, Jean Le Maitre, and even a few received death threats from the English. Bishop Cochon denied Joan's appeals to the Council of Basel and the Pope, which should have stopped his proceeding. The twelve articles of accusation that summarize the court's findings contradict the already doctored court record. The illiterate defendant signed an abjuration document that she didn't un understand under the threat of immediate execution. The court substituted a different abjuration in the official record. Heresy was a capital crime for only a repeat offense. Joan agreed to wear women's clothes when she abjured. A few days later, she was sexually assaulted in prison. She resumed male attire either as a defense against her molestation or in the testimony of Jean Messu because her dress had been stolen and she was left with nothing else to wear. Eyewitness described the scene of the execution by burning on the 30th of May, 1431. Tied to a tall pillar in the new Martian ruin, she asked two of the clergy, Martin Ledvenu and Isambard de la Pierre, to hold a crucifix before her. A peasant also constructed a small cross which she put in front of her dress. After she expired, the English raked back the coals to expose her charred body so that no one could claim that she had escaped alive. Then, they burned the body twice more to reduce it to ashes and prevent any collection of relics. They cast her remains into the same. The executioner, Geoffrey Theridge, later stated that he greatly feared to be damned. A post-mortem retrial opened after the war ended. Pope Calixtus III authorized this proceeding, also known as the Nullification Trial, at the request of Inquisitor General Jean Réal and Joan's mother, Isabel Romé. The aim of the trial was to investigate whether the trial of condemnation and its verdict had been handled justly and according to canon law. Braille drew up his final summary in June 1456, which describes Joan as a martyr and implicates the late Pierre Cochon with heresy for having convicted an innocent woman in pursuit of a secular vendetta. The court declared her innocence on the 7th of July, 1456. It was the publication of works by secular historians in the mid-19th century which seems to have sparked widespread public efforts to ask the Church to officially canonize Joan of Arc. From 1849 to 1878, Felix Donaloup and the Bishop of Orleans led efforts which culminated in Joan of Arc's beautification in 1909, held in Notre Dame de Paris. During the subsequent fighting in France during World War I, Allied troops carried her image into battle with them. During one battle, French troops interpreted a German spotlight image projected onto low-lying clouds as an appearance by Joan, which greatly bolstered their morale. Her canonization came on the 16th of May, 1920. Over 30,000 people attended the ceremony in Rome, including 140 descendants of Joan of Arc's family. Oh. 